James chapter 4 verse 1 and we begin reading in this fashion what causes fights and quarrels among you don't they come from your desires that battle within you you desire but do not have so you kill you covet but you cannot get what you want so you quarrel and fight you do not have because you do not ask God when you ask you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures you adulterous people don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God therefore anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy against God therefore anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world I've read that becomes an enemy of God or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us but he gives us more grace and that is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble submit yourselves then to God resist the devil and he will flee from you come near to God and he will come near to you wash your hands you sinners and purify your hearts you double-minded grieve mourn and wail change your laughter into mourning and your joy to gloom humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up brothers and sisters do not slander one another anyone who speaks against a brother or sister or judges them speaks against the law and judges it when you judge the law you are not keeping it but sitting in judgment on it there is only one lawgiver and judge the one who is able to save and destroy but you who are you to judge your neighbor and we trust God will bless the reading well let me make a start anyway anyway good morning bless you for being here we are looking this morning at our continuing topic of James but today we're looking at James chapter 4 verses 1 to 12 which I read from earlier on the key verse for James, which we're probably familiar with, is in chapter 1, verse 22. And the NIV says this, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. In the Living Bible, it says, And remember, it is a message to do what? To obey, not just to listen to, so don't fool yourselves. And then in the New King James Version, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. And then in the contemporary English version, it says, Obey God's message. Don't fool yourselves by just listening to it. So very simply, all of those different renderings say the same thing. Do what God tells us to do. Don't deceive ourselves and think by just listening to the word that we can do it. James chapter 4, 1 to 12, if you have your Bibles, or whatever you might be using, I still prefer a real Bible, uh, we break that down into four portions, into quarters. Verses 1 and 3 uh, talks to us about the source of conflicts. Verses 4 to 6 focus on friendship with the world. Verses 7 to 10, humility and submission. And then verses 11 to 12 at the end is all about judging others. So that's where we're going this morning. That's opened up the pathway. Let's see if we can walk along it. So let's go to verse the first one, verses 1 to 3, the source of conflict. And the writer says this, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Romans chapter 7 verses 14 to 25 reminds us that there is an ongoing conflict between the old and the new. And Paul, when he wrote that in, in chapter 7, uh, spoke about the struggles that he had with his old nature and with his new nature we are reminded that we make all things new we are a new creation the old has gone the new has come yet the old keeps rearing its ugly head within us because the sinful nature that we all have 
is still there. Even though our sins are forgiven and we are made righteous in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, we struggle with the nature all the time. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, uh, Paul writes about that struggle. He says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep them from doing the things you want to do. And, and what is our desire today? Is it to do the work of God? Is it to demonstrate the love and the power of God? That's our desire and we are full of good intentions that we're going to live as Christ wants us to live. But within us there is this ongoing struggle and the old dog keeps barking at us and we end up being what we once were. And I think it's a bit like two magnets. You try and bring two magnets together and, and you just can't bring them together. No matter how strong you are, how resolute you are, those magnets are opposed to each other and they keep pulling apart. And that's how we feel sometimes that life is a real struggle. And the Apostle James is talking about in-house fighting and quarrelling don't they come from the desires of the battle within you? What are those desires? To be number one? To get our own way? To have things as we want them to be? To, to be comfortable how I want to be comfortable? And, and those things are going on all the time. The battle that we have, and we try to overcome them, and, 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 and it's there, it's a daily occurrence. And... and we wake every morning thinking, I'm not going to allow the old self have control. But within a very short time, we find that we have fallen far short and the old nature comes up again. And we think, is there any hope? James writing to this Christian community that we're constantly at loggerheads with each other, grieving one another, battling with each other because they wanted their own way. And we think, is there any hope? Can I ever, ever become whom God wants me to be? Well, our confidence then is in Christ. 1 John chapter 4. You, dear children, that's us, are from God and have overcome them. That is the battles of the world because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And I think sometimes we fail to recognise the strength and the abilities that we have. We are so used to failing, we're so used to falling short, that whatever we do naturally will, will become subjected to that failure syndrome. But John writing reminds us that we are from God we are children of God and, and identity is really important, isn't it? Who we are, who we belong to, where we come from. And, and you get these ancestry hunters and these programs looking into people's past because they want to know where they came from. I certainly don't, I'll tell you. No, in my background, little, I'd rather it was just left there in the past. But there is a sense that we need to grasp that truth that we are the children of God. We are peculiar people. Hallelujah. Peculiar unto God. Because God's spirit is within us. We have been transformed by the power of the blood of the Lamb. We are not normal. We are abnormal. And I think it's wonderful when people say, Eric, you're crazy. You're not normal. Hallelujah. I'm not normal because I'm a child of God. Therefore, we have this ability within us to grasp the great truth that the old self is dead and gone, has no power or authority over us. And these desires to be kingpin can be overcome because the Spirit of God helps us in our weaknesses. When we are weak, then we are strong. And the writer goes on to say, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. You quarrel and fight. Now, 
I don't suppose for one moment this Christian community killed each other. But, you know, every time we stand against one another, it's, it's almost that's what we're doing. We're destroying, we're hampering, hindering a word of God, a work of God. We are taking somebody's confidence away. We are inflicting pain and suffering on someone else just to get our own way. Our confidence has to be in Christ that we can overcome, that we can no longer be like those of the world, but we are distinct and separate. Because, you see, it all depends on our heart's desire. We always do what we want to do. We always find time to do what we want to do. Eric, I'm, I'm too busy to do this. I can't help because I'm doing X, Y, Z or A, B, C, whatever, and all the bits in between. But there's always time to do what I want to do. Always time to go to the places that I want to do. So, God, you'll have to get in line because actually what I want to do is more important than what you want to do. Matthew chapter 7 says this, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. What is our heart's desire? It says in verse 3, When you ask, you do not receive. Why? Because you ask with wrong motives. One thing that I find so frustrating is when people don't say please or thank you. There was a, a, a guy phoned me up and he, and, and I was, he, 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 was, he was helping me. And he said, name. I said, please would be nice. Eric. Address. Six Beacon Way, but please would be nice. Postcode. I said, it would be really nice if you said please. Oh, yes, I'm so sorry. Please. What a difference it makes when we all, and we're all perfect. I bet you all say please and thank you. But I can't help myself. If, if somebody does something for me or gives something to someone and they don't say thank you, I say thank you or please because our motives have got to be right and we have this, our heart's desire. Ask and it will be given to you and you and find knocking the door will be open for you because we ask incorrectly. What is our motivation? Lord, help me this month with my bank account. Help me to have a surplus at the end of the month. And uh, there's lots of American and British preachers will say to you, yeah, if you send me £10, congregation, you will get £20 back from God. Wonderful. Who is the winner in all of this? Me. I'll be able to have another holiday amongst the others. But what is our real desire? What is our motivation when we pray to God, when we ask God for things? Is it because we want to see God's name truly glorified? Do we really want to see the church full to overflowing with those who are perhaps less desirable than us? You know, uh, James writes in chapter 1 or chapter 2 where, where they were favouring the rich. Bring all the rich people in. That's a good idea. Then the treasure will be full. We don't want those who don't wash. We don't want those who have got no home, but we want all the rich people. You know, we, there are some, some church leaders, you know, say we want a young people's church. We don't want old people. Because old people, well, you've had it. Your day is over. You're no good for anything. We want young people because they've got energy. They've got money. They've got enthusiasm. So what happens when that church of young people becomes old? Where do they go then? See, the gospel is not just for young people, but it's for all people of all ages, of all groups, of all class. And when we pray, Lord, send your Holy Spirit, what are we really asking him? You know, we need to be ready for the consequences of our prayers. One brother prayed, Lord, you've got to sort out my diaconate. And within three weeks, two had died and one had left the church. <laughs> So we really need to be very careful what we pray, but our desire must be always the glory of God. And, and, and James was saying there that you, you ask because we want, that you may spend and get spend what you get on your pleasures. Solomon, when he was made, uh, appointed king, he prayed, Lord, give me great wisdom. And God gave him wisdom and he became wealthy and, 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 and profitable. But in the end, that wealth took him away from the kingdom of God. 
and he failed miserably. But it sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? Fighting, quarrelling. You don't get because you don't you don't ask correctly. Is there any hope? Of course there is. Romans 8 says, In all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. Through Christ Jesus there is victory over the flesh. There is victory over despair. There is victory over wrong motivation. Laziness. Wrong use. The source of conflicts is because of this ongoing conflict between the old and the new. Let us then, as God's people, stop that. Let us allow God to work in us. Because we are more than conquerors and we might say, well, I can't help, that's who I am. That's a poor excuse, isn't it? That's who I am. Who am I? I'm a child of God. Spirit of God lives in me, Christ through me. Therefore, I should be able to control my tongue. I should be able to control my anger. I should be able to control my desires. But the battle is still there like those magnets pulling apart. But there's victory. Verses 4 to 6 speaks of friendship with the world, you adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us. But he gives us more grace. That's why scripture says, God opposes the proud but shows favour to the hum humble. Friendship with the world. We live in a beautiful world, don't we? Created amazingly. Stars in the sky that shine so brightly. The moon radiates the sun's glory. The leaves on the tree, the, the gentle waters, it laps the seashore. What a wonderful place we live. And we love the world in which we live because God created it. But the apostle's not saying that. What he is trying to say, do not love the things of the world. Do not love material possessions. Do not love uh, particular doctrines or, or whatever. Our first love should be the Lord Jesus Christ. 1 John 2 says this, Do not love the world or anything in the world. Not the sunshine, not the stars in the sky. He's not speaking about that. But it's fame and glory. It's the, 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 the wealth that we might accumulate, the jobs that we might have, the education that we might gain. For if anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in him. One of the, 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 the greatest hindrances to the gospel in our country is football. And I love my football. And if you saw the ladies play on Thursday night, well, what a match that was. Germany beat us 4-3. Friday night it was. Dreadful. But the enthusiasm of people. But you go anywhere today, and where are young people? playing football now I understand that I loved football and I was able to play it but it's a real hindrance isn't it and we have to say what keeps us away from church what keeps us away from uh, the prayer meeting what keeps us away from fellowship because we prefer other things to come into church we announced one Sunday that it was going to be no evening meeting as it as Glenn announced next week and someone said, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to do on Sunday night? I've got that, that couple of hours to do with it. I don't know what to do with it. And it's almost we can have that attitude where, where Sunday becomes a routine. We come out in the morning, we come out of an evening. And if we don't, we, we're lost. If anyone loves the world, love of the Father is not in him. We are here because we love the Lord Jesus. We're here not because we love the musicians. They're doing a great job. They didn't know that John wasn't going to be here. So thank you for, for working so hard. We're here not because of the great coffee. And it is great coffee. I won't tell you where it comes from, but it's great coffee. But we are here because we want to worship the Lord Jesus. We are here because we love him. I've been amazed this last few days. The, the um, young man who sadly died from JLS and the scenes of anguish outside the hotel where he died. Young people beside themselves with grief. Beside themselves. 
And I think, how foolish is that? But what they're doing, they're demonstrating their love, rightly or wrongly, you know, whatever where your opinion might lie, for this young man who lost his life aged, I think it was 34, I think. 31. 31. Died. Heartbreaking. But they were there because of him. You're here this morning, not because I'm preaching. You didn't know I was preaching until you got here, but thank you for not going home again. But, <laughs> but we are here surely because of our love for the Lord Jesus. Acts 4 verse 16 says this, As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. They couldn't help themselves. You know, they were arrested and they were tried by the Sanhedrin and they said, you can go, but don't speak of Jesus. And what was their response? I oh, will be good. We don't want to get any more trouble. We don't want to rock the boat. We don't want to mark the waters. We'll keep quiet. No, what they said was this. We can't help ourselves. Because the love of God within us constrains us to speak and to preach and to teach. What grandparent doesn't bore the tears out of everybody else talking about their wonderful grandchildren? And between Richard and I, we've got hundreds of them, haven't we, Richard? So we could keep you here all day merit with the merits of our grandchildren. But you'd soon become disinterested because they are special to us. And yeah, they're special to lots of people, but not in the same way as they are to us. And whenever we're there, we can't help but speak of them. And that's, that's, the, that's the sentiment, isn't it, of, of the fact when we are with Christ. How can we not speak of this man who died to save us, who has given us new life? You know, we might say to somebody, oh, I went to church on Sunday, and there was some good music, and the preacher did, went on too long, but... Those disciples couldn't understand. They couldn't keep quiet. But we live in a world of changing principles, changing scruples, changing... Uh, there's no boundaries anymore. And it's very easy for us to go along with these things, isn't it? But Psalm 119 says, Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the, the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his commandments, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. In other words, psalmist is saying there can be no compromise amongst God's people. We cannot compromise the word of God. We cannot water it down. We cannot say, oh, that'd be all right. You'll be fine. Just live a good life. Just keep going. Do the best you can. God will forgive you. Rubbish. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. There is no way except through Christ Jesus and him crucified. Reading the scripture, praying, coming to church, it's not enough. You know, we can, we can know the Bible inside out, back to front, upside down or whatever. But at the end of it, if we don't know Christ as our saviour, it means nothing. It means nothing. All will be in vain. So it's easy, isn't it, to, to do anything for a quiet life. But as God's people, we have a responsibility. We have to proclaim the gospel. We have to speak up and speak out and show that there are things that the world cannot um, push upon us. Verses 7 to 10. I've no idea what the time is because that clock at the back says 10 to 2. So we're fine already. Verses 7 to 10 speaks to about humility and submission. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Humility and submission. These Christians were proud people. Proud of their heritage. They were Jews. That was their background. That was their, their history. Proud to be a Jew. They knew the law. Loved the law. And yet James says, submit yourselves then to God. I used to love going wrestling. And uh, I got banned from going to our local wrestling arena because I got carried away one day and got involved and hit the wrestler and he jumped out of the ring and it all got a bit out of hand. But the idea of wrestling 
is to make your opponent do what? Submit. Three knockouts or three falls and one submission. And it's that submission that you battle against. I'm not going to give in. Whatever you, you can twist me, you can throw me, you can stamp on me, but I won't submit. I won't give in. Oh, but we are called to be submissive to the will of God. Not my will be done, but your will be done. And there was a real sense of pride amongst these early believers for who they were, what their history was, where they had come from. And, and I think about... Uh, dear, I dear. Think about how the disciples argued amongst themselves because they wanted to be number one. You remember how Jesus was sitting at the table and, and, and uh, the disciples were next to him? And they were arguing, and, and they were arguing. Jesus said, what are you arguing about? Said, Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus said, the first shall be last, and the greatest among you must be the servant of all. Do we, do we really want other people to get the glory more than us? Do we want what's right for others in preference to ourselves? Do we really want God to change us? Do we really want his spirit to, to motivate us and to lead us and to guide us? Matthew 23, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Who am I to stand here in front of you and, and preach God's word? Does that make me better than you? Does that make me more knowledgeable than you? No, of course it does not. I'm just serving a purpose, God's purpose. And any one of us can do things for, for the Lord Jesus. Any one of us can do things for God. Whether it's just helping put the chairs to one side, that's helping the kingdom of God. That's no more glo less glorious than me standing up here and, and talking to you. We're all involved in God's work, in the kingdom of God's work. We all have a part to play and no one is any more important than anybody else. No one work is more important than any other work. Philippians 2 verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Count others more important than yourself. Put others first. Think about that. Do nothing from selfish ambition. It's We so often want our way. We want church how we like it to be. We want it in those good old days. And it must be wonderful for men one side and ladies for the other side. That was just, and, and, you know, I grew up in a brethren, I got saved at 50, went to a brethren church where women weren't allowed to speak. It was heavenly. <laughs> but maybe not right. But it wasn't right for the ladies because they were hampered and hindered. So ladies, you are welcome here. Do nothing from selfish ambition. Psalm 40, I'm moving on. I just, it says, I desire to do your will because God's law is written on my heart. It's what God wants is what's important. Not what I want. I might not like the music, I might not like the modern songs, I might not like the, 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 the new international version or whatever. I'm not saying that I don't, I'm just... But what is important is what God wants. Surely that's the most important thing, not what I want. And you know, if we are, if we are seeking each other's well-being, then we're going to get along fine, aren't we? You know, if, if, if I do what Cressy wants... And that would help her. And she does what I want and it helps me. We're going to get great. And I do love Tressie. And we got on really great as it is. But it's that sense, isn't it, of trying to outdo each other all the time. Humility and submission because we want our own way. Uh, verses 11 to 12, judging others and we move on. You know, James was against that. Do not slander anybody. Do not uh, harangue each other. Because it's practical not to do so. It says in Mark uh, chapter 3, If a house is divided against itself, 
that house cannot stand. How can we move on? How can we be effective if there are arguments and schisms and, and things like that? It's a practical thing, isn't it? How can we how can we promote the gospel if we are at loggerheads with each other? If there is unrest, if there's dissension, if there's unhappiness, if we are selfishly wanting things our own way all the time. That's a, a childish thing, isn't it? Children have to have everything their own way all the time. If a house is divided, it cannot stand, it will fall, in other words. And, and the number of fellowships that we are aware of that have, have come apart at the seams. Because people don't like what they don't like. Nation against nation, family against nation. It's a command not to do so, John 13. A new command, oh, I've got two minutes, that's good. A new commandment I give to you, love one another as I have loved you. How has God loved us? How has Christ loved us? Totally, completely, unselfishly. He did not do one thing for his own benefit. Everything was for us. Everything was for us. All that he did turned water into wine to demonstrate the change that happens when we allow God's spirit to come into us. Raise the dead, grant unto us new life, eternal. How can we not love each other when it's a command to do so? But it's also not just practical, not commanded, but it's essential as well. For you, it says in John 13, your love for one another will do what? It will prove to the world that you are my disciples. There's evidence that we love each other, that we are concerned for each other, that we want the best for each other, that we want to ensure that, that, that whatever we're involved in, it, it promotes the well-being of the whole body, not just part of it. Essentially, if we want to see people saved, if we want to know a movement of God's spirit, if we want to see growth in our fellowship, then let's make sure that we are at togetherness. At togetherness, you know what I mean. And that's what Jesus said that. They'll know you're my disciples, not because you can quote scripture, not because you can sing the songs, not because you know where you sit in church, and we all sit in the same place, don't we? It's because of this love that we have for each other. We might not like each other, but we can certainly love each other in the gospel. Mark chapter 7, take the plank out of your own eye, then you can take the speck from your brother's eye and so much more. Key verse to James one twenty two: Do not merely listen to the word, so deceive yourself. Do what it says. So, summing up. James chapter 4, verses 1 and 3, the source of conflict. Stop. James says, stop this bickering. Stop this arguing. Stop wanting your own way. Let it stop now. Be warned that friendship with the world is enmity with God. We can't have one foot in the world and one foot in, in heaven. It's all for Jesus. The old hymn writes that all to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. Some of us have been married a, a forever. But you know, when we get married, we didn't say to our wife or our husband, I do, I now pronounce your husband and wife, and then you go back to your separate lives. Yeah, we come together. We live together and we strive together. And we can't be a friend of the world and a friend of God. Jesus is a friend of mine. Let's stand against the things that we're being coerced into. Humility and submission. Let's humble ourselves before each other. Submit to the will of God. Follow Christ's example. Because he said, not my will be done, but your will be done. And lastly, when it comes to judging others, let's just love one another. Why? Because love covers a multitude of sin. Now, I, my, our children are not perfect. Our grandchildren are not perfect. And I'm certainly not perfect. But in our household, I am viewed and loved as no, like no one else. And our children are loved like no one else. Because they are ours. 
And it's that love that holds us together. It's that love that will hold us together as God's people, that will encourage us and give us the ability to surge forward. James 4, 1 to 12 can be a very negative thing. But he simply says, stop the conflict. Warned, friendship of the world is not to be had. Humble ourselves, follow Christ's example, and let's love one another as Christ has loved us. Let's not just hear the word, but let's do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us about your word. We thank you that you are in control. May your spirit continue to work in us, changing us more and more into your likeness, because in Christ alone we live. Amen.